Hello, welcome back to Christian's Colloquy. I'm Christian, and I'm so glad that you could join me again this week. I know if you're a regular on the channel, I'm sorry to disappoint, but yes, I was gone again for at least a month. I apologize about that. As most of you know by now, if you're a regular to this channel, I am a PhD student, and sometimes my life gets incredibly busy with that between school and church and just everything else going on. So just a brief explanation, my final papers were submitted, then suddenly I was very busy thinking about comprehensive exams and my thesis prospectus and all those good and wonderful things, but here we are, we're back, and at least I have four or five episodes planned and the scripts prepared for, so uh, we'll have at least four or five weeks of content here on the channel I hope you look forward to, and of course, if you have any suggestions, please leave them in the comments down below, send me an email, reach out on Discord or Twitter or Facebook, wherever you have me. This is a colloquy. This is not only a conversation with me in the past, but also me and you. So please be in touch. Anyway, today I want to introduce another evangelical figure to this channel, a 19th century evangelical like many others we covered, but this time a bit unique. Again, we've looked at many formerly enslaved Africans who became great evangelical theologians or poets or activists, but this time, rather than a formerly enslaved African who ended up either in North America, like Phyllis Wheatley, or in England, like Odalao Aquiano, we're looking at a formerly enslaved African who actually ministered for the vast majority of their life in Africa. So today, I'm going to introduce to you the great and amazing evangelical Christian Samuel Ajayi Crowther. So let's get to know Crowther who he was, what he did, and then I will just give you a few points of impact that will hopefully prompt your own further study. Anyway, this is Crowther, starting with his early life. Samuel Crowther was born in 1807 in southwestern Nigeria to Yoruba parents. So, uh, the Yoruba people is a group that you might have heard of or may not be familiar with, so I thought I would just take a brief excursus to introduce the Yoruba people. The Yoruba people are one of the major ethnic groups in Nigeria and, as a result, one of the major ethnic groups in Africa as a whole. To give you a reason why that is, the Yoruba people are very populous, well into, I believe, 56 million people in, in and around Nigeria and the dis diaspora. But also, part of the reason why they're so well known is that Nollywood films and TV shows are often uh, directed and acted in by Yoruba people. So I've begun to watch some uh, Nigerian shows and often they are speaking Yoruba as, the, as their uh, indigenous language in those films. So... Yoruba people, one of the major groups, that's who Crowther belongs to. And just to give you an idea of uh, where, where they are, religiously speaking, uh, they are quite diverse. And there's a pretty large split between Sunni Muslim Yoruba people, but also Christians of various denominations, Anglicans um, being among them. And it's also interesting to note that Yoruba traditionists traditional religions, so often what we might conceive of pre-Abrahamic uh, pagan religions indigenous to the region, they have had those traditions a major impact not only today as many people still practice Yoruba traditional religion, but also across the diaspora when we think of slave religions in the Afro-Caribbean or in uh, the southern United States, often those will have links to Yoruba traditional practices. Anyway, that's the Yoruba people. That's the, the group to which Samuel Crowther belonged to. Crowther, in 1821 and 1822, he was captured as a slave and sold to Portuguese slave ships. So even this late uh, into history, in, well into the 19th century, slaves were still being captured, especially along uh, that western coast of West Africa. But... Since this was later into the, the 19th century, as we have discussed previously on the channel, the slave trade was abolished by the British Empire at that point. So shortly after being enslaved by these Portuguese slavers, Crowther and the people who were captured were actually freed and rescued by the British Royal Navy. That again, we can uh, think back to... Um, William Wilberforce, that great evangelical statesman in the British Empire, working alongside figures, uh, evangelical churchmen like uh, John Newton or Odilao Equiano, who fought hard to see the slave trade abolished in the British Empire. And that we see it playing out, that slaves who were captured by uh, different kingdoms, such as the Portuguese, were being freed actively by the British Royal Navy. And that's what happened to Crowther. 
Notably from that for Crowther's personal life and story, he married Susanna, another slave who was freed from those very same Portuguese ships. Now moving on to Crowther's conversion. Crowther, after being slave, uh, freed from slavery by the British Royal Navy, was taken under the care of the Church Missionary Society, the CMS, who were operating heavily in Sierra Leone. That's another country in West Africa. And the Church Missionary Society, we have covered them extensively on the channel, one figure being Henry Venn. I suggest check out his episode, A Beacon of er uh, Evangelical Spirituality, but as we'll also talk about in a moment, very influential in the life of Crowther and the development of Christianity, Anglicanism, Evangelicalism in Africa, specifically West Africa. From there, under the care of the CMS, uh, Crowther was taught English, he was baptized in 1825, and taken to England to attend the CMS's school, which was in Islington. But, unlike many uh, freed Africans who were taken to England, Crowther would actually head back to Sierra Leone, head back to Africa where he would minister most of his life. He attended Fora Bay College in Freetown, Sierra Leone, the capital there, and it's while studying in 1827 to the mid-1830s that he fell in love with linguistics. Linguistics would not only be a passion of Crowther, but also a place where he was incredibly influential, not only on the spirituality of Africans, but also the specifically evangelical Christian spirituality of his fellow Nigerians, Yoruba people, and Africans as a whole. In 1841, Crowther, Crowther served as the interpreter for the Niger expedition. That was an incredible expedition, a failure in 1841, but a place where Crowther would see firsthand how evangelical missions were carried out, and a place where many evangelicals, such as Henry Venn, due to the failure of the mission, would see the absolute importance of missions in Africa being spearheaded by Africans themselves, those people who knew the language, knew the land, knew the culture, but also who could e easily not only survive, but also thrive in the conditions of uh, Africa, where there were many diseases and issues that Europeans just weren't built to handle or uh, be equipped to deal with. So, very important in life. I'll leave a link to the Niger expedition so you can look further in the description down below. From 1843 onward, Crowther worked to translate the Bible and the Book of Common Prayer into Yoruba. So, again, he was an Anglican under the CMS. So he was, as an evangelical Anglican, not only committed to getting scripture into the hands of Africans in their indigenous languages, first in his case, uh, Yoruba, but also Igbo and other languages later on, but also the Book of Common Prayer. So being an Anglican, he felt it was not only useful, but also beneficial to have the Book of Common Prayer, that book of services, in the hands of indigenous Africans in their own indigenous languages. So again, starting with Yoruba, his own people group's language, but then later on moving into other African languages, Igbo being a great example of another Nigerian people group that is uh, quite large and populous. In 1864, Crowther, at the behest of evangelicals like Henry Venn, was con consecrated the Bishop of Western Africa in the Anglican Church. It's from there that he was the first African uh, consecrated a bishop in the Anglican Church as a whole. So again, lots to say there, lots of story around that. And of course, as a bishop, he had quite a drama dealing with uh, European Christians, dealing with uh, the politics of the church, and of course, uh, reaching out to different uh, African people groups, including the Yoruba people. There's a lot more that could be said there, but I encourage you in the description down below, I'm leaving a link to a lecture from a Kenyan pastor speaking on uh, evangelical missions in Africa as a whole, and Crowther, of course, features prominently in that lecture. Please check it out. As a final point, I will just say that Crowther is a fascinating figure. Today, I just wanted to introduce you to a bit of his life, a bit of his history, his conversion, and his ministry. He's interesting for so many reasons, and it would be so useful to get to know his story for so many reasons. In his life, we see what it looks like for a formerly enslaved person to be freed, how that related to life, relating to missionaries who cared for him, taught him English, how he did his schooling in England, but clearly had a heart to go back to Africa and to reach African peoples whether that was in Sierra Leone, Nigeria, or other Africans. I'm saying Africans a lot because he was the bishop consecrated for Western Africa as a whole. It's important to remember that Africa 
isn't a country, isn't a, uh, a monolithic people, but there are so many different tribes, different languages, different cultures, different practices and religions. And Crowther, as a Yoruba man and an evangelical Christian, not only felt obliged to reach his own people group, but so many others there. And a key part of that ministry for him was not only interacting with the colonial powers and advocating for Africans alongside people like Venn and other allies among the white population, but then, of course, a large part of that was linguistic translating the Bible, translating Book of Common Prayer, translating many other spiritual works that would help Africans of a variety of different peoples and tribes get to know the God of Christianity, the God of Israel, the God of the English, but also the one and only living God that they had to know, who they were obliged to serve and worship, but who also blessed them with the gospel. So again, Crowther, great example of evangelical spirituality, great example of why and how evangelical spirituality isn't only for white people, that it's an evangelical spirituality is something we all should embrace, should all see, all get to know, and hopefully understand that it is the best expression, and again, I'm biased, I'm an evangelical Christian, but the best expression of biblical truth and fidelity applied to individual lives and Christian communities. Anyway, that's Crowther. I hope you look forward to hearing more about him in the future on this channel, and I hope that you will join me again next time when we will take a look at another person, another question relating to not only evangelical spirituality, but church history as a whole. But until then, take care.